there you go. And however, uh, I guess when, when Pamela gets here, however you want to introduce her, but she's coming. So I'll go ahead and say that she's going to be part of the show at the, at the beginning. And then you can just, when she gets here, you can let her come in and however you want to do that. Does that sound good? That sounds perfect. All right. So I think we're ready to go. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the All Souls Community Forum coming to you from All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm Joe Robertson, a member of this church and a member of the Forum Committee, a forum that for nearly 80 years has sought out important conversations promoting critical thinking on the most compelling and challenging issues of our day. Today, we welcome Arletha Bland Manlove and Pamela Bland, that's the aunt and the mother of Matthew Bland Williams, who was shot and died July 23rd, 2020, at the age of 26. The terror of gun violence that stalks Kansas City is further agonizing to the families of victims like our guests who were thrown into a system that they say offered no help, no answers, and no peace, a system that they want to see reformed. So Arletha, who's here with us at the start of the show, thank you so much, so much for joining us today. You're welcome, Joe. Thank you for having us and bringing this, this topic uh to the public because i think it's one of those things that you have no idea what's happening because most of a lot of us aren't um a lot of us aren't impacted by these kinds of situations and so it's 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 something you just don't know until you're in a specific horrific situation so i want to introduce you guys to matthew bland williams And he was um, very gregarious. Um, he uh, had a really interesting personality, extremely inquisitive and curious about life um, and all aspects of life, kind of not held down by our general norms. And when I say that, um, he was uh, um, almost unteachable. Um, and I say that because he was so very smart um, academically from the jump that he would fall asleep as a little kid in the French magnet and, and wake up, take a test, ace it, spoke fluent French. He just really had a hard time being challenged. And I think at that time, the systems understanding how to meet his curiosity and, um, and he, of course, in immaturity, having a hard time, you know, making this information known in a way that was palatable to a classroom. Uh, so he was very, like I said, bright, um, energetic, sweet. Um, and as he grew and was becoming more into himself, he really started to determine for himself what was next. Um, he dropped out of high school in his junior year, I believe, and then uh, went back and did his GED. He was one of the highest scoring GEDs in the state of Missouri. <clears throat> and he um, started to get into the purchase of cars um, and working towards a broker's license at the time of his death, or I'm sorry, at the time of his murder. And he uh, was, like I said, just working through how to be a young African-American man here in Kansas City and in the world. Um, we um, were given a call on July 23rd, we were celebrating my brother-in-law's uh, birthday. And uh, we got a call uh, from his um, significant other at the time. And uh, she just said, Matthew's been shot. And she would not articulate too much more than that. Uh, we tried to find out where he was. Um, and it was just unclear. He had already been taken at that time in an ambulance. However, at the scene, 
there were, of course, police officers and detectives. And um, we were instructed to go to Center Point Hospital. So we're in Midtown, Kansas City, Missouri, not too terribly far from All Souls Church. And we um, jumped on the highway and on, um, you know, all the way there, um, communicating back and forth um, with the girlfriend who seemed to be communicating with someone in authority um, because they were like, we think he's at center point. We think that's where they're supposed to take him. It was just really unclear. And all of this happened in independence. And so we got to center point and asked, was he there? And they were like, well, we don't know. Uh, we don't have, I, we don't have anyone by that name. And so then I said, okay, is there a, you know, young African-American male um, here who was shot? Um, and so they were like, well, there is a young man here. He's being worked on. I said, okay, so what, where does his mother go? And they said, no, no, his mother's already here. His family's already here. And so, you know, I went back out to the car. I called the scene and the girlfriend again, and they were still like, no, no, he's at center point. And, and so went back in. So I went in three times trying to determine was my nephew there? Um, I got a second response and a third response of he's not here. There was another person that was shot in a similar area. He is at North Kansas City Hospital. So we, at this point, many family members have been called. They're all in route. Um, some of them were actually in the parking lot parking and we all went over to North Kansas City Hospital. At this point, we're an hour and a half in almost. And we get to North Kansas City Hospital which was a journey and lots of construction. Uh, and North Kansas City Hospital does the same thing. We, we have no gunshot victims here. And I'm like, okay, I just left Center Point. They told me there was somebody here that was shot. We're just the family. I have his mother. We're trying to determine where he is. And, and they're like, we have no gunshot victims that have arrived here in the last several hours because I was being specific. It was after six o'clock and you know and they were oh we don't have anybody that was here and uh or that is here um in that route i had reached out to other people because we were getting no real information about where our loved one where my sister's my sister's son and my beloved nephew was i mean we had no idea where to go um we then reached out to other people that we had relationship with. And that is how we found out um, that Matthew was in fact deceased and um, that he was in fact at center point. So we had to all, um, there was very physical reactions to the news. Um, Matthew was an only child, so his cousins were his siblings, particularly my niece and her husband, who had been with him earlier in the day, and he had called my, uh, my nephew, my other nephew, and said, hey, let's hang out. And he was like, hey man, I just got off work. I'm really tired, I, I, I'll call you back. So there was a lot of physical reaction to this news. Um, we all then eventually kind of gather ourselves. We get back to center point and we're, we're asking, can we verify this is him? Um, and we were denied. And I didn't understand. At that point, there was no threat of safety. There was no logical reasoning 
um, for us to be denied in the sense that there's ways to look through, there's, there's ways to, uh, to look into the room maybe, or um, I have a friend who was allowed to look through the window to verify their loved one. Um, we were not, we were denied that. Um, we did not see Matthew's body until the day before his funeral. He was murdered on the 23rd of July and it was the 28th of July before we were able to see his body. I was able to see his body. Um, it was really difficult in those days to process a loss that was for us unverified. Fingerprints are a process. Um, ID is a process. Uh, for loved ones, there is an emotional process. Um, there is a verification um, because it's emotional and because it is family and because it's who you care about, whether they're family or friends. And we were denied that. Um, I, I truly believe these entities were thinking they were following a process. And I get that they all need a process. For us on the other side and on the other end, it was torture. It was the opposite of compassion. It was a opportunity to really see a side of systems that I had never experienced. Um, and so it was, I nor our family had experienced. And so um, had it not been for years of prior relationships, I don't know when we would have actually known for sure um, that A, he was deceased, where he actually was. I don't know when that would have really transpired because we had the opportunity to call and get answers. And so in this process of anger, you start to think about, well, what about the people who don't know anybody? What about the people who don't have these relationships and how do they process this information? Um, it was, um, that was a failure. That was a failure for, for me on the, on the hospital's part. Now, I will say the young lady at Centerpoint, I honestly believe it was not malicious. It was not malicious. It was just the process. And even after the threat was gone and we went back and Matthew was definitely deceased, the young man that shot him was in a completely separate hospital and there were no other people of threat anywhere around, still being denied the opportunity to see our loved one was an un uncompassionate process. And uh, then, we fast forward to the next morning and um, we get a call because he was a donor and had been a donor since he was 16 on his license um, or his ID, his driver's license. And um, wasn't shocking. And so we spoke with um, Midwest Transport Network about the donation of the organs that they could um, utilized, which were supposed to be eyes and long bones. And that was really it because he had already passed away. So there were some organs they could not harvest, um, which kind of gave us a, a bit of relief in that moment that there was something good coming out of this horrific moment in our lives. <clears throat> And uh, my sister went through a very long, um, about an hour's worth of questions, um, compassionately um, questions to, to, to figure out 
all that was going to happen in that process. And um, she found Midwest um, Transport to be, again, compassionate about how they approached the situation. And um, I think it was two days later, they called us back to say um, all that they had um, harvested were uh, not going to be utilized because he was he had COVID. And um, I was on the phone with the funeral director when they called me to tell me that. And the funeral de director did not know that. Um, at that moment. So the so Matthew's body being released back to the funeral home didn't have the proper tagging to say he had COVID so that they could invoke their COVID protocol. So I told the funeral director and she literally was like, oh my God, I have to hang up. And then she said, they're calling me now. So I got the call, then the funeral director got the call, which is out of process. Uh, and so what they were able to harvest was now unusable. So that felt like in that moment, another blow. It was really difficult. in those moments, for us as God-fearing people, you're trying to figure out how to make sense of something you're not truly 100% sure that's really even happening to you, but you're following the words and you're doing the processes that are, are necessary and excuse me and so in that moment where you think someone else's life will be benefited by this beautiful life that's no longer here only to find that that's not the case so as the main point of contact kind of to protect my sister um in deeper conversation with the funeral director, they harvested a little more than they had initially mentioned to us, uh, which made it difficult for them to dress him. So all of these processes that seem to be missed um, on the receiving end as family members felt like blow and another blow and another blow in a situation you've never fathomed to be in. Never, never would I have told you or thought that he would be a victim of murder, intentional murder. Never would have I thought that. And so it was um, concerning and I still want to wrap all of my head around what could be better solutions, but honestly, we're still dealing. We're still walking through it. And he would have been 28 on last Sunday. So as a family, we're moving forward, but we have, he has about 13 cousins and 10 of them are in his age group and his peers. So for them, it's a struggle still. They're dealing, they're dealing better. I think we're all trying to do better. And for some of us who are older, you adjust and determine the new normal. Um, he is ever present. Um, 
we talk about him often because I want them to remember him. I want them to not think about the end, but think about all the processes and all the play and all of the arguments and fights and disagreements and, and playtime and dance-offs and all the other ways in which they were able to interact with him and give light to my sister who lost her only child. We went then through the system of the court. And I will say that it is not what I thought it was, um, especially as um, Matthew being deceased meant that most of anything that was said in his defense would be considered a second party or a third party. And so there, there was the way in which they talked through uh, that situation that was really hard. It was just hard. And to find out the young man had um, shot someone before and things like that just seemed to remind us of a part of the system that is still needing some work. And it's a lot. It's a lot to process and it's a lot to um, walk down. And the hope is that we will um, have more um, conversations with these entities soon about any ways in which to improve that because that whole process was nothing of what I thought felt helpful, concerning, or um, even heard, it, it, it's, it's, you become completely invisible as a person who's got someone um, in a tragic moment, you, you just feel completely invisible. And um, my mom was a state senator. You learn early to walk a fine line, some of us, because you don't want to throw out names and try to say, I'm mine, 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 because that is not the way in which we were taught to walk through our lives. And so um, we were fortunate that we had had relationship with people that we could call to get an answer, just an answer. We couldn't even get an answer of, is he at this place or that place? Is he alive? Where was he shot? We got none of that until about 11 o'clock at night. The incident happened at about five something in the evening. So that was a long time to go around trying to figure it out without anybody offering something that was a little more concrete. So, you know, it was just one of those, one of those things you just don't know until you're there and in it. And it was, uh, I think it leaves opportunity for us to, to really look at these systems and figure out, is there a way to improve them so that people can have some kind of opportunity in those moments to talk to somebody that can help them like hospitals and police are supposed to. Ready? So I'm gonna introduce Matthew's mom. Pamela is here, so. And you don't have to say anything if you don't want to. Uh -oh, I'm gonna get you in screen. Get a little closer together there, sis. So we're live. Uh -oh. And look here. And there we go. So everyone, this is Matthew's mom, Pamela Bland. And 
Sweet. Good morning. I apologize for being late, but it's been kind of a hard morning. Uh, yeah, well, well, as a host here, I welcome uh, Pamela. Thank you for joining our, our, our discussion. And, uh, and Arlita has really described a lot of the difficulties with the process and how you couldn't get answers from the hospital and the police. Uh, I guess if you would just like to add anything that was particularly difficult or anything that you want people to know from your particular experience that night and since then. Um. I don't know what she's really covered, but I'm sure she covered a lot because uh, she has a knowledge and pulled me through a whole lot of this. And if, maybe if you would just want to talk, what was the most difficult part for you? What is the what what was the experience that you think most people should be aware of? <clears throat> I think the most difficult for me was not being able to see my baby for almost 10 days. I mean, I just kept getting the run around at the hospital. They kept back and forth, and I'm sure she already covered this. And we ended up at the first hospital that we were at, and like I got there, they would not let me see. They kept saying, oh, you'll be able to go back in a minute, and I never got to see him until the day of so it was always this openness of maybe it's not true maybe they're just holding it back for me because maybe he's in bad condition and they don't want me to seem like that but uh, I did not see my baby until I stepped into the funeral home and uh they did an excellent job on it compared to what he was brought to them looking like. And so uh, I don't know, I guess that was the hardest part was the running back and forth. We went all the way from uh, Independence, Missouri to North Kansas City. I cannot remember the name of the hospital there. And uh, just back and just the back and forth uh, of it all. And I don't know how some of it leaked, obviously, because my nieces and nephews start calling me and they knew about it before we even knew about it. The first thing we knew about was uh, we were on uh, at a Dollar Tree because we were getting ready to, as a family, celebrate my brother-in-law's, or well, my sister's brother-in-law, uh, his birthday. And so uh, we were there trying to, my sister and I were there trying to get some cards and stuff to, for that celebration. And... Uh, we got the call and I was in line and she ran into the store and said, we got to go right now. So she was very, um, I, I don't know, I don't know the words, but she kept me together. I probably would not have been together. I mean, God knows everything and he knows where to put you, what time to put you there and everything because if she had not been with me at that particular time, I don't know what would have happened because I don't drive the freeway. I don't, I have to process a lot of things. They don't just click with me like that. I have to process them. And if she had not been there and been as calm and collected as she was, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what I would have been. And she's just like his second mother. She's more than his aunt. She's like his second mother. And uh, I, you know, I just don't know what I would have done. But I, I feel like I was failed in the process of the system or the uh, things that should happen not only with the system, but the things that should happen from the, the hospitals, from the uh, detectives, from the 
Mm. You know, nobody was really supportive. We just kept getting misinformation and getting the runaround, and we didn't deserve that. It's not like we came in there raunchy or, I mean, we were very low key compared to what was going on with us, but we just kept getting the runaround. And, uh, and then, like I said, people knew about it before we even had any idea what was going on. It was out there in the media. So in one way, I think the media is good to bring us information that we need. But for me and people in my age category, and you know, I'm a retired teacher, so I'm not stupid. I'm very intelligent. I, like I said, I just have a time with processing stuff, but uh, so it can make sense to me. Uh, and for this to have happened to anyone, it's just devastating. I mean, you're already broke down and wondering where where God is. And then, but it's times like this when you really need your family and not pre just pretend family, you need family that's going to be there for you and help you hold together, even though they breaking apart. But I guess we breaking apart together. And that's the main thing is that you you know, you you need to be close to your family, even if there's some disagreements and stuff, you need to try to work it out because it's nothing like family. You know, I was 40 years old when I had Matthew. I really had come to the conclusion that I was not to have kids, which I didn't understand because I was, kids was my life, uh, teaching and everything. That was my life. And, uh, out. And then when he came along, he became my life. And all of my kids, they even today, I mean, you know, up to uh, I've had some phone calls this weekend telling me happy Mother's Day and stuff like that. And some of them still ask me, how Matthew doing? And then they said, oh, Miss Bland, I'm sorry. You know, so it's like he was not only a light in my life and our life, he was a light for a whole lot of people that we did not even know. The only reason I know that is because I had I made a booklet to turn into the prosecuting attorney uh, for the trial. And it's a it's about one, two inches, and it's full back and front of just stuff from people, young people, old people, disabled people, everybody that I could think of that I had contact with or that had contacted me that knew him as a person, not just as my son, as a person, they reached out and sent. So we made this notebook. I have it right here because I didn't know if I needed it or not. Mm -hmm. But he had, and my sister, when she, I didn't even know I was pregnant, but she went to the doctor with me because it's like something ain't right. <laughs> and so she went to the doctor with me and she also went to my first sonogram and everything. And so she knew, I think if she knew he was a boy, but she just knew, she, she named him Skittles. And he went by that name. Come to know, people in the world, uh, in his world, knew him as Skittles. Uh, and so, and she said she named him Skittles because he was such a bright light. It was just bubbles. When she saw the sonogram, it was just bubbles all over everywhere, just different color of bubbles. And it was interesting when I had people write these uh, remembrances of him, how many people brought that out, that he was an inspiration. When he walked into the room, you knew he was there. 
because he just brought a light with him everywhere he went. And that was so inspiring. And that kind of kept me together too. After uh, I, I got that, had after I had gone through the process of putting this book together and uh, that, that opened up my heart to even more than what it was, but it just let me know that he was who I thought he was and a, and a bag of beans, <laughs> you know? So it's like, but that light, it's just even times now when the family's all together, something will happen and they'll say, hello, Matthew, <laughs> you know, cause we know he, he's always around. He's probably here right now in some form or matter. Uh, some of my nieces and nephews do communicate, still communicate with him. Uh, so, you know, I, I I don't know what to say. It's just, I, I have a lot I can say about him because I always, it's always, that's why it was kind of strange for me this morning because I've had a hard morning. I've been, uh, I've been awake since six o'clock this morning and I had my things all ready for today I was looking forward to it because I was planning on going to church first and it was like my sister was like uh we're not gonna be able to do that <laughs> and I'm like okay so it was like but the, then the from that time it just I kept breaking down and uh I haven't done that in a long time and like now I'm even that's not me I usually try to keep things together and I think I do for the most part but this is harder than I thought it would be so and I appreciate you all taking the time to listen and taking the time to kind of put this message out there the message is there's so many other options you just have to look into them and find out which one is right for you uh, than to just kill somebody over some nonsense because that's all this was about was just nonsense thank you Arlie. Hey. well pamela thank you so much uh we're and uh, arletha we're going to um, take a break here to and get so we can people get uh some opportunities to ask some questions first we're, you know we've been listening to pamela bland and arletha bland man love on the need for reforms and how Kansas City supports the family of gun violence victims. So we're gonna take a break here to tell you how you can support this forum and also take a look ahead to next Sunday's forum. Uh, we take up a collection to help cover some of the costs of this forum, including equipment and staff. You can contribute online at allsoulskc.org by clicking through the support button and selecting the form on the drop down menu or uh, you know, on Zoom here, you can also uh, uh, click on the link that I believe will be put put in the chat. And uh, next Sunday, the forum will explore the question of how Kansas City tells its story. Kansas City, the Kansas City Museum Collections Director Denise Morrison will describe the process of deciding whose stories get told. Okay, so now we return now to today's forum and, and to ask a question, you click on the raise your hand icon. And if you're here in person, of course, you can step to the uh, camera. And those of you in Zoom, don't forget to uh, to unmute. All right, so uh, Richard uh, Richard has a question. First of all, I am terribly sorry about your son and nephew. No one should ever have to experience this. Um, the question I have is, uh, how did he, someone who had already shot someone, I think you said, get access to a gun? <laughs> Uh, it's even deeper than that. I I, I don't know. Uh, that's one of the questions. It's like he never should have had access to get it. He was on probation. As a matter of fact, he was on probation when he decided to kill my son. Uh, And, it, it, and from the things that I found out, it wasn't a, it was, due, so it was not just a, all of a sudden, this hits me uh, instinct. 
it it had kind of been planned out. Uh, but the main thing, how first of all, how did the system? How did he get it? not once but twice? He's been he's been in prison. He has been in prison since he was, um, I think, thirteen years old, 16. fourteen or mm-hmm. something like that. But I don't think that really mattered. But he's been a part <laughs> of the system for a long time, and I think the system. It's not broken, broken, but it definitely needs some healing because I think he was on probation the first time because they were trying to put him as a juvenile, you know, give him a chance to go and do it. He did what he was supposed to do. So he was, he was, he was, uh, he, anyway, he did everything he was supposed to do to get out. And then once he got out, he did something else. And he was, I don't think he was actually put in jail, but he did have, get some, something taken off of his uh, probation. I, I'm not really sure, but that doesn't really matter. But the thing is that the system, it works to a certain extent, but then it's still broken. It's badly broken because he never should have been out especially after the second time. He he never should have been. And if I might uh, get to the question here for, for both of you all, I know that uh, you know, when, you, when you have shared with people, I know you've spoken with groups and things, when you talk about the difficulty in the system, like getting answers, or any information from police or detectives or hospitals, or even with the transplant networks and things, once you start doing that, have you heard other stories from other family, vic- family? victims of uh, families of victims have you is yeah. is your experience are you seeing it being shared by other people and, and when they've had this situation happen i haven't have you yes but <clears throat> yes not necessarily the donor situation but yes in in reference to the way in which the day of um the shooting how we were rerouted and not given information it has been absolutely shared um oh and and people who have been through this are like oh yeah that's what they do Mm -hmm. from lawyers doctors and citizens it's oh yeah that's what they do and i get that there is a process um of protection of protecting the the hospital and and its staff and and the citizenry that are there for other things. Um, So yes, I have heard that um, and it seemed to be accepted as the process and the practice and you know, the apathy that goes with that. Well, we can't do nothing about it. And I think that that is where the misnomer is that there is opportunity to try to get more information of why this process was put in place and then is there a way now to update that process um, given the way things are today from security on is there a way to update that process so that the families are not victims themselves again by those processes what kind of interest? I know there's been a, there was at one point there was a task force that was put together that, to work on this. I mean, what kind of interest have you really gotten from from the prosecutor's office or the police departments, detectives, um, and hospitals to try to make things better for families? I definitely um, have not, and I don't think my, we have not as a family really reached out to ask more questions. Um, Again, we're still trying to heal through this. Right. And it is it is one of the um, harder things to go and have conversation about because when you're extremely emotional about it, you put people kind of on edge. They're, they're not able to really work through it, I think. So um, I have not heard any outcomes of the task force. Um, I have not heard anything more about that. Um, And um, I think that we're just now getting to the place where we can go and begin to have these conversations um, and make some requests 
of explanation so that we can get to help them get to what is happening and is that still necessary and are there other options in today's world? And I know you're familiar or have grown more familiar with the just the community and how it, in, in your in your neighborhoods and things the people that you're familiar with that there's already a kind of a crisis of trust in you know police working with police and working with investigators and that uh, this so the process that you've encountered here uh, does that damage the uh, any efforts to try to improve that trust and how what do you do about it? I definitely think that in our situation, we specifically started to deal with from the night of the murder, we were dealing with two um, detectives. Um, we had a detective that was assigned to us that night and for about the next week, and then he's moved on and then you're left with the sergeant. In our initial encounter, the first detective was compassionate yeah. he was compassionate and he yeah. returned calls even on his off days because we don't know his schedule so he returned calls on his off days the sergeant was not um very good at the communication um you know your loved one has jewelry your loved one has clothes your loved one in the clothes we weren't worried about but there was um you know a necklace, a specific couple of necklaces that he wore all the time that we had no understanding. Again, we Thank are not you. familiar with this process. We, this is not our lives. This is not my every day or my every year or my every lifetime. This is a once in a lifetime situation that we've encountered. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having a liaison that says, okay, this is how we, I mean, there's ways to make those things a little more palatable while still remaining the police. Um, I don't know that that in any way improves my thought of police. Police are necessary. We need them. Um, I think that there are, I believe the majority of the police are doing the best they know how to help shepherd our society in ways to keep people safe. <clears throat> and we experienced both. We experienced someone with compassion and would answer questions and would do the best he can. And we experienced someone that was not that in that moment. And so it did not reinforce um, all of my life. I've said there, there are things that I don't ever want to encounter, the police, and the jail uh, or, and a judge, because mm -hmm. that's not the way I want to live my life. And so, um, although I know judges and two police officers, I think at this point, a couple of sheriffs, I'm, you know, that's not a, that's not people that are in our family. That's not an industry or, or a career that people in our family choose. So as a result, I don't have strong relationships with police officers most of the time when I've encountered the police, it has been through positive situations, helping with a walkathon that I was sponsoring or things like that. So I have not had to encounter police in situations that were harder or rougher mm -hmm. other than the marches um, in 2019 where, you know, that wasn't always a good way to see them um, as seeing us as protesters as hostile. So no, it didn't help or reinforce the police are the go-to folks mm -hmm. when you're in trouble. It did not reinforce that for me. And did you ever get uh, any good explanation or as to why the hospitals were having, you know, the misinformation was going around? Is there anything that could be done about that? No one reached out. No one reached out. No one, um, yeah. No one reached out, no one uh, really reciprocated um, our concerns because in the initial, um, you know, we're, we're fighters. Uh, so, and when I say fighters, I mean in that good sense of, hey, this is what was missed and we did not get a reach out. So again, I think we're getting closer to the ability to, to really go back and dive into that. Um, I am certainly closer to being able to do that. 
All right. Hey, now, Craig, did you have a question that you want to ask? Should I say that one person did it? Reach out. Oh, well, yeah, if somebody yeah. did. I don't know. Yeah. I'm sorry, my sister I, had a I different... I can say that, and I thought I had shared this, but it's been two years, so. But there was a man from the hospital that did reach out to me, but not being negative or not, but he was a very, very nice man. But the reason I think he reached out was because he had had situations with my mom. I think he was on some kind of medical task force or something. And my mom, when she was a senator and a legislator and my brother, um, they have always been advocates for the community and advocates for health issues. And I think that's the reason, I could be wrong, but he was such a nice person and I can't find his name, but he, he was, and he did reach out. And I don't know if that's because, you know, he knew mom personally and he knew that we were a part of that family. So I don't know if it was a legislative move that he reached out or just a personal, it seems like it was just a personal reach out and he just happened to be at the hospital, work at the hospital in some manner. So, um, and then the, the, uh, the group, what is it? Women, uh, uh, mothers against crime or mothers, mothers against, against violence, mm -hmm. mothers against violence. That's true. They have been very helpful. That's true. From they, they actually gave a um, balloon, even though it was raining down cats and dogs, they still were there with us and they had speak, they had reached out. We didn't put the thing together at all. They did. And they had reached out to people that were close to us, uh, ministers, uh, legislators. They had reached out to a lot of people. And even though it was pouring down, raining, we were able to have this uh, balloon, uh, release. balloon release uh, and just have people speak on the, and I think that there was a, some reporting group there Channel four was a channel four, channel it's five. Yeah. It was some channel that channel that was there when it happened. So, but they have still been very supportive. They'll reach out mm -hmm. um, every now and then to see how how I'm doing and how the family's doing. So okay. that's let, let them answer. Huh? Somebody's got a question. I think I think that Craig oh. you have a question. Yeah, I do. Um, actually, two. Um, first of all, through the investigation they did, were they able to determine what the motive was? And two, were they able to successfully prosecute the other guy? Yes, they were able to prosecute him. Um, uh, the it, the um, motive for the um, young man that shot him was, um, I, I, you know what, I think it was self-defense or something, mm -hmm. even though I'm not saying what it was, I'm saying what, the, what they said it was, which um, I believe they said it was self-defense. There was a whole triangle thing happening, girl mm -hmm. to guys, a whole thing. Um, so it was not a pretty thing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a yeah, good thing. Um, and so they um, did um, say that that was the defense of the young man that shot him and he was prosecuted. Um, he was prosecuted. Um, he should be jailed for 20 years. 26. And then there was possession of a firearm as a felon. So he got some additional time. Um, so you know, again, that's nothing it, you know, this was a tragedy. This is a tragedy. The young man that shot M Matthew was, I believe around 23 to 26. He's a father. Um, there's gonna be a child that grows up with a um, 
different relationship with it, with their father. <clears throat> so it's 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 a tragedy. And although I'm really angry that that young man thought that that was the only solution. Mm -hmm. That was also the reason why he should not be out on the streets because he only thinks the solution is to utilize a gun as opposed to any other mechanism of communication or of or even when we feel threatened, we don't get the right to just take someone's life. Mm -hmm. Life is bigger than a moment. And so not to get too soapboxy, Craig, but just Yes, he was prosecuted. Um, it happened pretty swiftly because where the incident happened was captured on a ring. And so it was all there. So what was initially said by the young man when he was found shot, uh, which was away from the scene, um, was then um, found to be um, inaccurate based off of the ring that was there in the video. Also, you were talking before, mentioned the Mothers Against Violence thing, and there's also an organization called KC Mothers in Charge, mm -hmm. a lot of amazing work along the line. I do believe both of them have reached out, and I'm going to tell you, in those moments, you're, you know, in that moment, in that week, in that month, in that total year, we were trying to keep our family together. This mm -hmm. was an extremely right. um, mm -hmm. difficult thing to the young people of our family. So we were, I, I think, greatly supported by community. Um, not only our entire village between all of our family members, our villages were awesome. Um, but those two entities, you're correct, Craig, and those two entities reached out and um, certainly offered support and information. I think we're just, we weren't ready. We just, we're processing. And um, being a part of somewhat of a public life, um, I process very, very personally. Um, I will speak out, I will try my best, but how I'm really processing, that is a personal deal and I'm not going to come out to process my complete pain um, when I'm unable to control my own emotions because that sometimes is ineffective. So they too have been great organizations to support us um, in questions and things like that in this process and I neglected to say that so thank you very much for bringing that up. All right, thank you. So we have been listening to uh, Pamela Bland and Arletha Bland Manlove, uh, the talking about the difficulty for families and the system after they've been uh, as the victims of gun violence. And uh, thank you uh, for spending on this you know so much time on this difficult subject today and and our and our push for reforms. And uh, and then next Sunday we will be. Uh, the forum will explore the question of how Kansas City tells its story and the, as the Kansas City Museum Collections Director Denise Morrison will be describing the process of deciding whose stories get told. So we hope to see you again next Sunday. And again, uh, Arletha and Pamela, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Well, thank you all for this opportunity to talk about this situation and you know bring awareness. And um, thank you for all you do to bring awareness about all that's ha happening and affecting Kansas City. Um, I really appreciate it. I've, I've started listening, Joe. <laughs> so I appreciate it. And all of your team uh, for helping us out today. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, so I guess we're, so we'll stop the recording there, but if there's anything else that